To, we've been in a sermon series that Dan has been teaching called No Compromise, and this is not officially part of that series, but I think you're going to see that it, it, it fits in. I think it dovetails nicely. Um, I've really been enjoying the No Compromise series, and I've been hearing that from other people as well. Uh, I'm part of a Tuesday, uh, Tuesday night men's <coughs> small group, and uh, we've really been enjoying the discussions that this has brought up. It's... it's uh, it's been good. Um, I did want to make a note. I, one week, uh, Dan mentioned just a, a content warning at the beginning that he was going to cover some sensitive topics and people wanted to be aware, especially if you have kids in the service. I want to let you know that I'm going to talk about some sensitive topics, but like Dan, I'm going to keep it PG. But that's just uh, uh, to let you know that we're going to be talking about some things, and uh, your discretion is advised. So, I want to start out by building off of some concepts from a few services that we've had over the past few months. Um, one of them is in July, uh, I had an opportunity to speak on a topic that I called First Things First. Um, then in September, Dan started this series of No Compromise. And in October, specifically, he spoke the message, uh, will you bow down or stand up? And if you missed any of these, and if I say something that piques your interest, you want to catch up on them, they're on our website, themission.church, under Media Latest Sermons. So you can grab any of those there, uh, rewatch them, if, even if you already heard them, and you want a refresher. Uh, but on... Mine in particular from July, I am going to give you a quick refresher right now, and hopefully I can make it quick, because <laughs> I have too many pages of notes here. <laughs> so what we talked about in, in that message in particular was a concept of first principles, and we were talking about first principles are a concept in logic. It's, uh, it's the basic fundamental point that you build a logical argument on, right? It's the, it's the foundation that you use oftentimes, you know, to support your worldview. That's generally when you're going to find yourself in any sort of logical conversation. And we looked at a specific example from Matthew 19 to see how Jesus was using first principles and applying them to the questions that he was being challenged with. I'm going to give a quick recap on that Matthew 19 story there and add some additional background information that we didn't fully cover last time, partly because some of it I've, I've learned more recently. But um, what was going on was this. The Pharisees, who were a group of religiously observant Jews, uh, were very concerned with technicalities of the law of Moses. And they asked Jesus to weigh in on an argument that was actually going on between prominent rabbis at that time. You see, in Deuteronomy chapter 24, Moses was laying out some rules about remarriage to a former spouse. And to set up the particular law that he was about to explain, he mentioned the circumstances under which the original marriage had ended. Now, unfortunately, what happened is he used a phrase where the words had become unclear over time, and that led to a debate over their meaning, which is what Jesus was getting roped into. This is what Moses said. He said, if a man marries a woman who becomes displeasing to him because he finds something indecent about her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce and gives it to her, and sends her from his house. And then he goes on to explain the law about the particular circumstances of remarriage that he wanted to address. Now the three prominent, uh, three prominent rabbis of Jesus' time had interpreted this in three different ways. And this is what he was being asked to weigh in on. Uh, the house of Shammai said, A man should divorce his wife only because he has found grounds for it in unchastity. Since it says, because he has found in her indecency in a thing. The house of Hillel said, 
even if she spoiled his dish, since it said, because he has found in her indecency of a thing. Now, that's just not very generous. <laughs> but then Rabbi Akiva also offered a third opinion, even if he found someone else prettier than she, since it says, and it shall be if she finds no favor in his eyes. So this is what was going on, and they're asking Jesus, where do you land on this? Now, I am sure that Jesus did not miss the irony here, which is that the Pharisees had taken a law about certain restrictions on remarriage to a former spouse, and they had turned it into a debate about when divorce was acceptable. That's not actually what Moses was talking about, and he actually hadn't even given a command on that topic. As an aside, I hope that you all don't miss the irony and that we don't miss the irony because we are still doing the same thing. Even to this day, Christians are scouring the Bible to find at what exact point God permits divorce. A quick search online will bring up thousands of different Christian opinions that you can read and find the one that you like the best, right? <laughs> Ranging from never to if it just isn't working out, and everything in between, okay? And just like the Pharisees, I think it's because we don't actually understand what marriage is. And that's what Jesus got to in his response to them. He said, haven't you read that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female, and he said, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh, so they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Now, Jesus was, this is where we get into this first principles idea. He was making an argument from first principles. He was going back to the creation account at the beginning of the Bible, in the book of Genesis, to the original design of marriage, and he was saying, God is the one who made this. God's the creator. And he's the one who gets to set the rules. And don't you think that you're being a little bit too presumptuous here? Right? So the question that we might ask ourselves now is, okay, I'm ready for, you know, I'm ready for the spoilers. Which rabbi did he side with? And the answer is, as far as I can tell, none. <laughs> and <laughs> there's reasons why I think that. Some people might say, well, maybe he sided with Shammai. But I think he really was landing on none. And I think that what he was really telling them here is, and we've got a slide for this, you're missing the point. That's Jesus, probably. <laughs> um, <laughs> so... First principles. Now, earlier this month, Dan mentioned four different hot topics in our culture right now that this was in the will you stand up or will you bow down sermon, right? That Christians need to stand up on rather than bow down. And these are the four topics that he listed out. Abortion, gender, marriage, and Israel. And you probably noticed that with each one of those, Dan gave specific verses of scripture to show the biblical worldview. In fact, on the middle two, he used the same verses that Jesus used to respond to the, Ver the Pharisees. And it's, it's interesting to me that especially with these top three issues out of these four here, they all share that common connection back to Genesis. They're all focused on the image of God as it was revealed in the original creation. Genesis 1 and 2 tell us that God created man, in, a man named Adam in his own image, and then he took part of that man and formed a woman also in his own image and joined them together into marriage, saying that the two would become one, which also reveals God's image because there's one God, but we as Christians understand that he is three persons, the Father, 
the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and that they are three persons joined in a unity of one, right? And then he told this to become, these, this two who had become one, right? He told them, be fruitful and multiply, revealing his image by creating new image bearers, right? So Dan and I were having a conversation on this topic several weeks ago, and he asked me to share part of our conversation with you this week. We were talking about three things that we can see, and this, this ties into this image of God thing here, that we can see about marriage and sexuality from Scripture. The first one is this. It's the origin of marriage and sexuality. We can see that it was created and instituted by God. We can also see that it was designed and defined by God. And that the original marriage shows God's intended context for sexuality. So that's what we can see about the origin of marriage. And we saw support for all three of these in Jesus' reference to Genesis chapter 1 and 2, right? Now the next thing after the origin of marriage and sexuality is the purpose of marriage and sexuality. And we can see, first of all, that companionship and unity is one of the purposes of marriage and sexuality. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. That's companion, companionship, right? And then we see in Genesis, later in Genesis 2 that this is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. So there's the unity, companionship and unity. But what else is a purpose of marriage? Well, procreation is a purpose of marriage and sexuality. God blessed them and he said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Genesis 1.28. And in Malachi 2.15, it says, but did he not make them one? And why one? Because he seeks godly offspring. That's an interesting point there. The purpose is not just having children, because any people with the right components can do that, right? What God is desiring here is godly offspring, right? And the, the, this uh, next purpose of marriage and sexuality is protection from lust, temptation, and sin. And it says in 1 Corinthians 7, 2, but since sexual immorality is occurring, each man should have sexual relations with his own wife and each woman with her own husband. And he goes on to say, do not deprive each other except perhaps by mutual consent and for a time so that you may devote yourselves to prayer, but then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. So we see here because of the rampant sin that was going on in Corinth and is going on in our modern day America. He said, there's a need for you to, you know, if, if this is a temptation for you, there's a need for you to have your own wife or your own husband, right? And then he said, don't deprive each other so that you won't succumb to temptation, okay? And now it's pretty obvious that this purpose didn't really exist before sin entered the world. Because temptation and sin were not a thing that people would have needed to deal with in marriage. But now that sin has entered the world, this is a valid purpose of marriage and sexuality. And Paul is actually using pretty strong language here. Some of our modern translations kind of, uh, I don't know, uh, weaken the words a little bit. But if you look back at some of the older translations, um, it, they actually use the word uh, where it says, do not deprive, do not defraud. And the Greek word means to rob or despoil someone by fraudulently keeping back something that's owed to them. So what he's saying is that 
if husbands and wives are not doing this, if they're not seeking to protect each other in this area, then they are actually guilty of theft. Now, I recognize this can be a very sensitive topic, and I'm really stepping in it right now, but <laughs> I want to clarify a few things here. Paul is not giving permission for husband or wife to make unreasonable demands of their spouse. That's not what he's doing. He's saying that there's a reasonable aspect where you owe something to each other in this marriage, right? But he's not talking about unreasonable demands. He's also not giving anyone the right to hold a grudge or to constantly remind someone else of their shortcomings in this area. So I just want to make sure that's clear. And if this is, if this is a particularly sensitive topic for you, because it's something that you're struggling with in your marriage, I would guess that it's very likely, not because of this particular issue, but it's because of an, a failure to understand the meaning of marriage and sexuality, which is the third point that we're going to move into here. So after we've understood the origin and the purpose, the meaning... The meaning is, as we saw in Genesis 1 and 2, to display the image of God. And, as we'll see in Ephesians chapter 5 here, it's to reveal the relationship of Christ and the church to each other and to the world around us, right? For this reason, a man will leave his father and his mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. That's quoting back to Genesis 2. And then Paul says, this is a profound mystery. But I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. So what he's talking about here is that this verse in Genesis 2, he sees primarily referencing Christ and the church, but he sees it in marriage. He sees that the marriage, the marriages that we have, are meant to demonstrate Christ and the church. And the way that we interact with each other, as he explains earlier in chapter 5 there, is that the husband should be taking the role of Christ, the wife should be taking the role of the church. And that's where Christ loved the church so much that he laid down his own life while we were still sinners. We didn't deserve it. That's super important worth each of these things. The other person doesn't need to deserve it in your estimation, right? It's what you're supposed to do. So if you're married, what is your goal in your marriage? Is your goal in your marriage to be showing Christ and the church to each other, to your children, and to the world around you? The last verse there, like I already mentioned, that verse 33 that's the how-to part. That's the how you do it. And I've, I've heard different people say that God, in, in giving this specific how-to, is addressing the things that men and women fail at the worst. Men don't do a very good job of loving a lot of times. And women don't do a very good job of showing respect to their husbands a lot of times. And so God is giving a command telling you, hey, you need to do these things because these are the things that, if I didn't tell you, you might not do them. If you're planning or hoping to be married, your reason for wanting to be married certainly has something to do with those purposes of marriage that we talked about, right? Companionship, unity, raising a family. Providing and receiving aid. But do you understand the meaning of the lifelong relationship that you're pursuing and your role in fulfilling it? Is your primary goal to reveal Christ and the church to each other? If you're single and you're staying that way, 
Are you protecting and encouraging God's design for marriage and sexuality in the church and in our society? Are you encouraging those who are around you in their relationships? Are you trying to protect the image of God being displayed through those relationships in the way that our society runs? So maybe when Dan laid out these topics, you couldn't quite see necessarily how those first three topics were so important and why he called them out. But hopefully now you have a better understanding of that. And I think one of the problems when we call these things out and we're talking about are you going to stand up or are you going to bow down is that we can get into this us versus them mentality, right? Like we have to stop the world from having their way, right? The image of God is being dragged through the mud by what these people are doing, you know? Um, we, we can't just stand by and watch it happen. We need better leaders and we need better laws. Well, I think there's truth in that, right? Good leaders make and enforce good laws. And the Bible says that righteous laws are like a school teacher that points us to our need for Christ. We see our shortcomings. We realize that we can't do this on our own, that we need Christ. And righteous laws that are fairly enforced, we should actually want those because they protect the most vulnerable and exploited groups in our society. That's a good thing. But, I brought a proverbial wrench with me today, and I'm going to throw it into the works now. <laughs> so, hopefully you're ready. This sermon was not stepping on enough toes, and it was going way too smooth already, so let's just <laughs> ramp it up a notch. What if it's not us versus them when it comes to protecting the image of God? What if they aren't the only ones dragging the image of God through the mud? Romans chapter 2, verses 21 through 24, Paul says, You then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? You who preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that people should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? As it is written, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. And there we can understand the word Gentiles to mean unbelievers. right? People who are not following after God. So our actions, our very actions could be what's dragging the name and the image of God through the mud. We already looked at one example of that. Um, we, we, we would look at what Paul just listed out and we would say, I'm not guilty of that. You know, um, hopefully, you know, we could all say, well, I don't steal. I'm not committing adultery, you know. I, I, I'm not robbing temples. Uh, I don't think I'm breaking any of God's laws that I can think of, so this doesn't really apply to me. But here's the problem. The reason we think that is probably because we don't define sin the same way that God does. Now, in Leviticus 19.13, this particular law from the Law of Moses uh, gives some context around what Paul was saying about not depriving each other. It says, do not defraud or rob your neighbor. Do not hold back the wages of a hired worker overnight. And that last part, don't withhold back the wages of a hired worker, what we can see is they did work for you. You owe them something, right? Don't hold back what you owe to someone else. You can see how that applies, not directly, it's not a wages thing, but what you owe to someone else, holding that back. I've meddled enough in that point. Um, <laughs> but the Bible also says that we owe a debt of love to everyone because of the love that we've received from God. 
And if we don't show that love in our interactions with other people, then aren't we also defrauding them? Aren't we holding back what we owe them? But we do hold it back in certain cases because we look at certain people and we say, eh, no, not them. They don't deserve. <laughs> they don't deserve it. Well, there's a parable that I'm not going to get into that would, should show you that you don't deserve it either, so you better show it. <laughs> Jesus spent a large portion of the Sermon on the Mount calling out these specific areas where we are not defining sin the same way that God defines sin. He, yeah, I, I would encourage you to read the whole section of Matthew uh, chapter 5, 21 through 48 to see all the examples he gives of anger, of lust, uh, situations of, of divorce, um, making and keeping oaths, like all, all of these things, right? We're just going to focus in on one because I think it's going to show us something that we can do here. And it's also going to give me a chance to really step on more people's toes. So it's going to be fun. <laughs> You've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Now when we look at that, and we see how Jesus defines sin, it might seem a little bit more relevant. When he said, you who say that people should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? What is he talking about? What is he talking about lusting? I think it's unfortunate in our society right now that we don't even have to think about what he was talking about, which was you know, creating visualizations in your mind and lusting after someone intentionally, right? We live in a society where the internet has ruined an aspect of life. For so many people, right? Statistics that, that you can find by searching this up online suggest that at least 60% of professing Christian men, 15% of professing Christian women, and 30% of pastors have viewed pornography in the past month. That is, that is shocking. Now, I, I do think that the numbers go down a little bit when you narrow it down to the group of Christians who are actively engaged in their faith. They're, they're involved in church and Bible reading and prayer, and they take their faith seriously. Because there's a lot of people in our country who, if you ask them, <coughs> you know, what's your religion, they'll check the Christian box. So we do need to be aware of that. But there are other surveys out there which suggest that the numbers are higher than that. So we can't be too complacent. This is, this, is, this is huge, and it speaks very poorly about how we are treating the image of God, right? And another thing, too, there is that, you know, it was 60% of men, 15% of women. But when you throw in written material, then that, that women's statistic doubles, right? Because we think about images and videos and those kind of things, but romance novels and, you know, uh, soap operas and those kind of things can often be just as bad emotionally for a woman as, you know, oftentimes for a man looking at an image. This, this level of sin, we need to deal with it. We need to realize that all of these things are telling lies about the image of God. They're telling lies about marriage and sexuality that is supposed to be displaying the image of God, that is supposed to be revealing Christ in the church, and we're dragging it through the mud. Statistics 
those same statistics say that half of the Christian men who are involved in that activity don't view it as sin. So I'm just going to tell you flat out right now, it is sin. It is a blatant lie against the image of God and the meaning of sexuality. And to see how did the early church feel about this, I want to look at an early church document that was written in the second century around uh, 170 AD. It's a book that was very popular with second, third, and fourth century Christians, um, but it's not part of the Bible, so it doesn't, you know, it doesn't reach up to that level. It's a book called The Shepherd of Hermas, and in book two, commandment four, chapter one, He's uh, talking to, I think this is an, an angel talking to him. Um, I charge you, said he, to guard your chastity and let no thought into your heart of another man's wife or of fornication or of similar iniquities. For by doing this, you commit a great sin. For if this thought, or let me see. Uh, but if you always remember your own wife, you'll never sin. For if this, this thought, he's going back to the evil thought, enter your heart, then you will sin. And if, in like manner, you think other wicked thoughts, you commit sin. For this thought is great sin in a servant of God. But if anyone commit this wicked deed, he works death for himself. Attend, therefore, and refrain from this thought. For where purity dwells, their iniquity ought not to enter the heart of a righteous man. You might be thinking, okay, how? Right? <laughs> if this is an issue that you're struggling with, what do I do about it? We'll get to that. I'm not going to leave you there. <laughs> but I do want to go back to... Jesus is teaching in Matthew. And really examine that. He says uh, in, in this passage, if, if, if it can just go back up on the screen now, I'm not going to read through the whole thing again. Um, but especially that second half where he's talking about uh, it, if your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out, throw it away. If your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away, Right? I don't want to get too base with it or whatever, but it should be pretty obvious to anybody who's struggled with lust why he's mentioning eyes and hands. So I'll leave that there. <laughs> but did he literally mean to gouge out your eye? Did he literally mean to cut off your hand? Or is he exaggerating to make a point? Well, Apparently, many first century Jews and even Jews, religious Jews of this day, to this, to this day now, believed that your body would be resurrected in the same state that it was when you died. So if you were missing body parts, you would be missing body parts in the resurrection. So what he was saying to them was incredibly shocking. And, and, and horrific to them. Like, well, gouge out my eye, what are you talking about? But that's why he said it would be better for you if you didn't have the eye than to have your whole body thrown into hell, right? You're trying to keep your whole body together. You're so concerned about that, but you're not concerned about the sin, right? But I think by shocking them in that way, his real point was to force them to admit you know, men have a way of making excuses. Well, I just have a wandering eye, right? Well, I think he wanted to force them to admit it's not your eye. That's not where the problem is. It's not your eye, and you know it. The problem is in your heart. We can see that laws are not enough. Laws can change behaviors. It was enough for the Pharisees to say, well, I'm not going to commit the act of adultery, right? But laws can't by themselves change the heart. 
you can see that that's what Jesus was getting at from these following passages. He said, for out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. Proverbs 4.23 says, above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Jesus said, a good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. And Jesus replied to the Pharisees, going back to Matthew 19 that we started with, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. But it was not this way from the beginning. Too often, we have been just like the Pharisees. We miss the point. We completely miss the point. They wanted to define out the technicalities. They wanted to know what is and isn't sin, where the line is, and then strictly observe these rules of behavior. But what did Jesus say to that? He said to the Pharisees, Woe to you, you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You're like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside they're full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. Let that not be us. Jesus didn't say that we shouldn't be outwardly clean. That's not what he was saying. Instead, he was saying that we shouldn't make an outward show of it and neglect our hearts. In fact, if you carefully read his teaching, you'll see that what he's actually saying is if you change your heart, Your outward actions will naturally follow suit. He laid out that principle in the parable of the sower. And I'm going to encourage you, this is, you know, some extra uh, activity. um, What? Extra credit, that's it. There you go. Thank you, Greg. I was, sometimes I just can't find something. And that's what you're here for. (laughs) So this is your extra credit assignment. Read Matthew 13, the parable of the sower. You can see all of this. It's also in, uh, it's in Mark, I can't remember which chapter, Mark, but it's in Luke uh, 8 as well. So Mark 4. So it's in those three different places and they each give it a little different flair. Um, For the sake of time, I'm just going to, I'm going to condense it down into four different topics four different action steps here. So Jesus talks about four things. The first one is soil. The second one is seeds. The third one is trees. And the fourth one is fruit. Now the parable of the sower, you know, he doesn't say trees specifically. He might be talking about grain or whatever. But in other instances, he's talking about the fruit. A fruit and the kind of or, I'm sorry, a tree. A tree and the kind of fruit that it bears. So, action step one, soil, which is the heart. Prepare the soil. Psalm 51, King David, he wrote this after being convicted by God of the sins of adultery and murder. Actual adultery and actual murder. So, just so we're clear. <laughs> He said, create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. If you've recognized, if you've realized that there's there's something wrong in my heart, there's something that needs to be changed, right? You can pray this. In fact, that whole psalm, Psalm 51, is great. You can pray this and ask God, create a clean heart in me. And what does God say? He says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone, so we don't need to have that hard-hearted problem, right? And give you a heart of flesh. Amen. The next action step that I have for you is seed, which is the word of God. Plant the seed. In Luke's telling of the story, Jesus explains to his disciples, he says, this is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. So the the farmer went out and 
scattered the seed. What was he scattering? It's the word of God. Now, in Genesis chapter 6, there's the story of the flood of Noah, right? We all know about Noah and the ark and the animals two by two. Why did God send the flood in that story? Why did that happen? It was because the thoughts and intentions of the people were all evil all the time. They needed to be flooded out. It might be the case that you feel like your heart is in that condition right now. The Bible says that the word of God is like water that can wash you clean. So, get rid of the bad inputs that you're putting into your eyes and ears. Get rid of, and this is going back to what Dan was speaking about in that first No Compromise, get rid of the worthless things that are filling up your heart and flood your heart with the word of God. Action step three is the tree, which is spiritual growth. The seed's been planted in your heart. Your soil of your heart was prepared to receive it, right? Now it's growing. But Jesus talks about a problem. In uh, Mark 4, he says, Still others, like seed that has been sown among thorns, hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, the desires for other things come in, and they choke out the word, making it unfruitful. You need to guard that word that's in your heart. You need to thin the weeds. And the last step is fruit, which is words or actions. Bear that fruit. Jesus said, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. What's growing inside of you? Hopefully the answer that you're going to be able to give now is the word of God, right? And it's going to produce that good fruit. But if you've been producing other fruit, where's it been coming from? It shows you a condition of heart, right? Paul said the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions... Envy, drunkenness, orgies, things like this. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. That means there's... He's specifically, I think, talking about the law of God, right? Right? Because all of these things that he listed out prior were contrary to God's law. But there's no law against these things. So yes, as Dan shared in an action step earlier in this series, vote. That's good. We do need good leaders. We do need good laws. But if that's all you do, I think you're falling short. Because we, as Christians, too often have been dragging the name and image of God through the mud, just as guilty as the them that we feel like we're set against, right? So vote, but get your heart right and start showing the fruit that we need to see. The change needs to start with us before we expect it to come from anyone else. And it will come. It will come. Yes. Yeah. Because God is faithful.